Galatians chapter 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith, we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. And as for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So going through Galatians, at this point in Galatians, this is a letter written to a group of churches in a place called Galatia. Paul, he's done defending his position as an apostle. He spent a lot of time on that. And he's done with his six arguments that trying to correct their false view of the gospel that somebody else set them on the wrong course on. Now he goes into this passionate sermon. And he's fired up here still. Verse 1, this kind of sets the stage of it all. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So Jesus Christ sets us free. He sets us free. He liberates us. He redeems us. Oh no, this again? Oh man. Verse 1, Jesus Christ means freedom. That's what you need to write down. Jesus Christ means freedom. He sets us free. And it's a different kind of freedom than maybe the kind that we would think of. Back then, there was, there was slavery. Lots of people were slaves back then. That was... That was part of their society. And so there were free people and there were slaves. And whenever Paul talks about sin, he talks about slavery. You are slaves to sin or were slaves to sin. And now you have been set free. A slave could buy their freedom or somebody else could buy that freedom for that slave. Jesus Christ paid the penalty so that we are no longer slaves anymore. 
this would have been a big part of their life. And so this is a powerful picture of what Jesus Christ is to us. We are no longer slaves. In chapter 4, verse 7 of Galatians, he says, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. So freedom, that means as in we are not slaves, but sons. We are not slaves. We are sons now. Children. And he says sons on purpose because back then, only sons could have the inheritance of the parents. And so, whether we are men or women, boys or girls, we have the inheritance as sons. Christ is going to share all of his inheritance with us. We are co-heirs with Christ. That's your Bible reading track for today. So, Christ has set us free. We are no longer slaves. And then he gets, he gets really sharp in verse 2. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, then Christ will mean nothing to you at all. It's very sharply worded. It actually starts with, look. If you want to translate it literally, look. I, Paul, tell you, if you let yourselves be circumcised, then Christ is going to mean nothing to you at all. So making Christ only a first step is to completely nullify him. Completely makes him irrelevant. This is kind of an all or nothing thing with Christ. Either he is the foundation of our salvation and we rest on him alone, or if we try to make him the first step, then he just completely crumbles. There's nothing left. If we're trying to earn our salvation in any way, then we are not resting on Christ. We are putting stock in ourselves and in our actions. And we are nullifying Christ. We're saying it's not enough. It's not good enough. We need Christ and this and this and this. No, that's not how it works. And if you do that, if we do that, we are rejecting grace. We're not saved by grace anymore. We're saved now by works. As it says in verse 4 there, you who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Now, He's not talking about losing your salvation there. We, we believe, at least in our church, we believe that, that salvation is an act of God by His grace. It's, it's a resurrection. You were dead in your transgressions and God made you alive with Christ. And He doesn't fail to save. But what is going on here, notice how He says, you who are trying to be justified by law. Those of you who choose to be justified by law are alienated from Christ. You have rejected grace. You've fallen away from it. But we, in the next verse it says, but we, we eagerly await the righteousness for which we hope. So trying to be justified by law is to reject grace. We just read the Ten Commandments earlier on. If we are saved by those, we are not saved by grace. The reason why we read those from time to time is because this is a guide for our gratitude. It shows us how we can show thankfulness to God by living this way. It shows us how we can live by the Spirit, as Paul also explains here a little bit. And it teaches us that we are sinners. This is not our means of salvation. I still remember doing chapel at a Christian school very close to here once. And I said, how do you get to heaven? And I had some answers, but one answer was, obey the Ten Commandments. No. We're saved by grace, not our works. So I hope that by reading the Ten Commandments here from time to time, you don't come to think that you are saved by them. This is a guide for our gratitude and how we live by the Spirit. And it convicts us of our sin. It shows us we need a Savior. This is not how we are saved. We are saved by grace through Christ and what He has done alone. 
In verse 12, this kind of makes me smirk. <laughs> As for those agitators, I wish they'd go the whole way and cut the whole thing off. <laughs> Just, he's mad. <laughs> he sure is angry. <laughs> and he's angry, not for no good reason at all. These are people who are telling, these agitators are telling these people that you have to obey the law to be saved. Christ didn't do enough. You have to do more. He's, they're telling him, you are, you are justified by works. You are justified by circumcision and doing the law. No. Why don't you just cut the whole thing off? He's really angry here. And for obvious reasons. Because if you are living to be saved by law, that is a miserable existence. It is a miserable existence. For years, Martin Luther tried to earn his righteousness. He thought that he had to earn it. He was a priest. And so that means he was a go-between between people and God. And he believed that. And so when he held up this, this body and this blood of the Lord, they believed that it actually changed in the real body and blood of the Lord. He would tremble with terror because he was holding the actual body and blood of the Lord, so he thought. And he felt unworthy. He knew his sin well. He felt unworthy of God's love. He felt like he was not doing enough to be saved. God seemed to him to be like just a severe judge like his father was. His father was a harsh man, and his teachers were harsh as well. And so at the final judgment, they would ask for an account, and he would be found wanting. So he sought to make use of all of the church's means. But Luther's overpowering sense of his own sinfulness, the more he sought to overcome it, the more he became aware of sin's sway over him. So he was a rigorous and disciplined monk, we don't really have a lot of monks anymore. But if you lived the monastic life, that means you ate very little. That means that your clothing was very uncomfortable, deliberately. It means that you had vigils by night, and you fasted by day, and you worked in gardens and other sorts of work that you might have to do. It means chastity, it means poverty, and it even means begging in the streets. It is... I'm going to have the most minimal existence possible. And Luther went even above and beyond that. He fasted sometimes days on end. He refused to wear blankets, and he nearly froze to death a few times. So if for sins to be forgiven, they had to be confessed, he was horrified that he might forget one. He thought he had to go to confession to have his sins forgiven. He spent hours listing and examining all his thoughts and actions. And he went to confession daily, sometimes six hours at a time. And his superior finally said, come in with something real to forgive, instead of all these picadillos. It is impossible and this is what he found. It is impossible to earn salvation because our entire nature is corrupt. It's not just simple acts that we do. We're corrupt in our minds and in our hearts. Our desires and our thoughts are not in line with God. If we had to list every one, we would be hopeless, like Luther was. There's no way. And he was miserable because of that. The Lord looks down from heaven. This is from Psalm 14. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Our whole nature is corrupt. Or Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? We are, our entire nature is corrupt. And so, we need a Savior. We can't save ourselves. It's not just a matter of trying harder or being good enough. We need to be saved. 
We were hopeless in sin. I like to eat apples. Maybe you do too. And sometimes if your apples are sitting on the counter for a while, they kind of develop spots. And so there's been many times when I've had to carve out a little spot on the apple so that I can eat it, right? Maybe you've had to do that too. But there was one time I remember I picked up this apple. It looked great on the outside. Took a bite into it. It was all brown on the inside. And I thought, well, maybe I just bat, bit into a bad part of it. I took bites out of other places. No, brown everywhere. I cut it open in half. The whole thing was rotten to the core. Our whole nature is corrupt. It's not a matter of cutting out one thing in our life. It's not a matter of just trying harder in one area or another. Our whole nature is corrupt. We need a Savior. And we are so fortunate that God didn't do with us what I did with that apple. There was nothing for me to do with that apple. I just got rid of it. I'll take another one. But God didn't do that with us. God loves us enough to send His one and only Son so that we would be saved as corrupt as we were. Look at the screen here with me. Why can't the good we do make us right with God or at least help make us right with Him? Because the righteousness which can pass God's scrutiny must be entirely perfect and must in every way measure up to the divine law. Even the very best we do in this life is imperfect and stained with sin because our entire nature is corrupt. So even when we're doing good things, we can have impure motives. And so one thing that came out of the Reformation, I mentioned it once before, but it's worth mentioning again, sola gratia. We are saved by grace alone. Just grace not works. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. There is nothing that we can be condemned for anymore. If you belong to Christ, then there is no condemnation for you at all. If you stand before God on that last day, there is going to be no spot on you at all. You are going to look as perfectly righteous as Jesus Christ himself would look righteous before God. We are saved by grace alone, in Christ alone, by faith alone, according to Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. If our works contributed to our salvation, grace would no longer be grace. Paul says it this way at one point in Romans 11, verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. If you have to add anything to your salvation, it's no longer grace anymore. Then it's by works. Now this grace of God, this can make people nervous. Because... They take it as if our actions don't matter at all. They think that, well, if we're saved entirely by grace, then that means our actions are irrelevant then. In fact, there's a Facebook group that I'm a part of, and there's all different kinds of people on there, and I had somebody say this to me this week. Why persevere if you already have the prize? It makes no sense whatsoever. When you talk about grace in this way, people get nervous. It's almost like saying your actions don't matter. At least that's what they think. This chapter in Galatians is the answer to that. You are saved by grace. You are free in Christ. But don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Serve one another in love. Live by the Spirit. This is what this whole chapter is about. It's not by law. 
God's grace is not permission to sin. Verse 13, you, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. God's grace is not permission to sin. Obedience is not optional. It's not optional. It's still required. Verse 21, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if your life is characterized by these things, these acts of the sinful nature, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. If your life is characterized by the Spirit, then you have evidence that the Spirit is working in your life. The way I think of it, and this is how I answered this this guy in this Facebook discussion. God tells us to call him our Father. Throughout the Bible, we are told to call one another brothers and sisters. And I don't think that's an accident. This is a prevailing picture that we have of how we're related to God. God's our Father. We are adopted children into the family of God. God's grace And our salvation is like being a child adopted into a family. We are adopted into God's family. And those adoption papers, those were signed by the blood of Christ. And those papers are signed and filed away, and that's that. Done. We belong to God through Christ, and there's no changing that. Done. But if you belong to a family whether by blood or adoption, your actions still matter. Your actions definitely matter. How we treat each other is incredibly important. Verse 13, you were called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Serve one another in love. Verse 15, if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Verse 26, Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Almost sounds like a parent trying to set the kids in shape, isn't it? Stop it. Stop biting and devouring each other. Stop being at each other's throats. You're brothers and sisters here. Our actions matter. And when we disobey... When we need to be set straight, God is our Father. He's going to discipline us. Not always does He discipline us because we're doing something wrong. Sometimes He disciplines us because we need to grow. So like if you're growing up in a family, suddenly you go from just sorting the silverware out of the dishwasher, at least this is what one of my early chores was, then you had to empty the whole dishwasher. Then you had to do all of the dishes themselves. And then you had to be responsible for dinner and dishes. So the chores got bigger as you grew up. God does that to us too. The responsibilities get bigger as we become more mature and as we grow in faith. The tasks become bigger. Not because he's mean. He wants us to grow up. And that's understandable as much as we might not like it. But let's say we are adopted into this family, and let's say we're just mad. We're mad at God, and we're sick of him, and we don't want anything to do with him anymore. We're sick of these rules of the house that we have to live by, and we just want out. We're going to run away, and we're going to forget about God. God, you are not my father anymore. I'm done with you, and we run away. As a parent, if your child says that to you, Are you going to just let them walk out the door? Okay, whatever, see ya. Are you going to let them just spend the night out in the cold where it might be dangerous for them? Aren't you going to call the police and all the authorities and do whatever you can to get your child back? If that child says, you're not my parents anymore, Those papers are still signed. 
That does not nullify your status in the family. God, our Father, when we run away, He comes to get us. He doesn't let us go. You belong to me. And that's why the most important part of that Ten Commandments is that first part. I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You belong to me now. Here's the rules of the house. We can do this the easy way, or we can do it the hard way. But one way or the other, it's going to get done. I'm your father, and I love you, and I care for you, and you belong to this family now. That's our salvation. Look at the screen again. How can you say that the good we do doesn't earn anything when God promises to reward it in this life and the next? This reward is not earned. It is a gift of grace. One more. But doesn't this teaching of God's grace make people indifferent and wicked? No, it is impossible for those grafted into Christ by true faith not to produce fruits of gratitude. If you belong to Christ and you have the Holy Spirit at work in your life, there is going to be fruit. It might not always be visible all the time, but it's going to be there. And that old nature is going to fade away. It might still pop up here and there, but it's not going to define your life anymore. God's grace teaches us to reject our sinful ways. When we live in this new house where God has adopted us, He's going to teach us a new way to live life. You're not on the street anymore. You don't have to beg for food. You don't have to steal for food. I'm going to feed you. You don't have to claw each other's eyes out to protect yourselves. I'm going to protect you. God takes care of us. Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So instead of dwelling on law to be saved, we are saved by grace. Let's live by the Spirit. The law... If we live by law, then we're about just doing the bare minimum. But the Spirit is about changing our whole life. It's about changing the whole way we look at things. Ourselves, lives, others, jobs, families, everything. We're looking at it differently now. That's living by the Spirit. So, for example, in the Old Testament law, you were required to give a 10% 10 of what you earned so that the temple could function. And some of us still use that today as a, as a guideline for how much we are to give to our church. At least I do. So if we're going to be legalistic, we could say, okay, we're going to give 10% before taxes. That's it. If we're going to be legalistic about it, we could do that. If we are living by the Spirit, then there's a whole way of looking possessions. Give. This world's fading away. Give. Give. Give without sparing. Give until it hurts. The stuff that you own is not actually yours. I mean, you belong to Jesus Christ. He owns everything that you have. Use whatever you got right now because this world is fading away. Just go nuts. By the law, it says... You shall not commit adultery, so don't cheat on your wife, don't have sex outside of marriage, okay? How much can I do before marriage? How, what's the bare minimum here? Or, you could look at it this way, sex is not your fulfillment in life. This is not, what, this is not the pinnacle of your existence. It's not even the best part of your marriage. The best part of your marriage is you're growing closer to God. You're being more holy. You're being perfected in godliness by it. It's about being one with God. That's what your life is about. Or by the law, don't take what isn't yours. 
Or you can look at everything that you own in a different way. Or by the Sabbath day. Do no work from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. There are still people who observe this. They're called Seventh-day Adventists. And they are very strict about that, or at least some of them are. You do no work from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. That's the Sabbath. That's in the Ten Commandments. That's an absolute law for all of us all the time. Or, by the Spirit, nothing is more important than worship. Worship is the most important thing that you do. This time, when you spend with God's people, worshiping God, concentrating on Him, hearing His Word, praying to Him, singing to Him, that is the most important part of your week. It is more important than your job. That time that you spend with God in devotions, in prayer, that is the most important part of your day. You should set everything else aside to make that happen. That is the best part of your day. The most important part. That is when you get to commune with God. Live by the Spirit. The law is primarily about actions, but the Spirit is a whole new attitude towards life. There was a friend that I had when I was a kid, and I was legalistic at that time. He didn't go to church, and he was asking me questions about what it meant to be a Christian. And you know what I said? I said, being a Christian means that you have to listen to certain music. It means you can only watch certain movies. It means that you can't use certain words. And it means that you ha- can't do these things on Sunday. I actually told him that. That is law. That is not gospel. That is not good news. That is not Christ. But that's what I said. And he never asked me about being a Christian ever again. And then, I've mentioned this before, but I worked at a grocery store. This was later in life when I was in high school. And there was this girl who came in the store and, and she noticed, she said later to me, how I would treat people. She noticed how, I, how much attention I gave to bagging the groceries, how I would bag just as well for one as another, how I would go out of my way to help people as much as possible, how I would smile at people and be kind to them. And she said to me later, I had no idea this was even going on, she said to me later, it made me want to become a Christian. Live by the Spirit. It's about a whole way of looking at life. This is what Paul's talking about. So as children by grace... Don't act like slaves, either to sin or law. You are not slaves. You are sons, children of God. Don't act like slaves. That's not who you are. Sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. That's Romans 6, verse 14. As God's children, live by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Be changed by grace. Serve one another in love. God is our Father. And we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's look at life differently because of grace. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father in heaven, it's so, it's so good to be able to call you that. Thank you for being our Father. Thank you for adopting us as your children. Lord, this grace that that you called us to be in, this family that we are part of, help us to help us to understand what that means and to grow from it, to understand it more, and to live by the Spirit that you give us in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.